Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Ashfaq and I'll be moderating the second of our Ikna ILF uh, webinar series. Um, for those of you who joined last week, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, announcements. So this is a 12-week series. This is the, the second in the, in the webinar series. And for those of you who joined last week, the link for the webinar is different this week. We're using a different platform. Um, but the link for this week, inshallah, uh, will continue for, for the remaining weeks. So the title of today's um, webinar is What Happens uh, When We Are Ungrateful? And inshallah, we'll be focusing on uh, verses 40 to 47 uh, of Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, today's uh, webinar, inshallah, will be delivered by Sheikh Muhammad uh, Al-Shinawi. Um, Sheikh Al-Shinawi is a research fellow at Yakim Institute. Uh, he currently serves as the resident scholar at IECPA, the Islamic Education Center of uh, Philadelphia. He's a graduate of English literature uh, and studied briefly at the Islamic University of Medina, uh, studying at uh, Mishka University. Um, so with that, inshallah, uh, I will give the floor to um, Sheikh Mohammed al Shinawi. Um, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. First and foremost, jazakallah khair and everyone for coming through and, and dedicating another night uh, to studying the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah sharpen with these moments your minds and purify with them your hearts uh, and make heavy with them your scales and guide with them your steps and illuminate and brighten with them your graves and the graves of your parents and the graves of your children. Allahumma ameen. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the ayat. The ayat that I hope are on the screen, if they're not, I'm, I'll apologize if all you can see is my face, uh, are ayat 40 through 47 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And before I read to the ayat and give a brief breakdown of the words, and, and then we'll reflect on them, inshallah. Surah Al-Baqarah, of course, is uh, is the lengthiest chapter in the Quran, was revealed when the Prophet wasallam first came to Medina. Uh, essentially or almost entirely. Uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, of course, in the beginning, at the first onset of the surah, it divides people into believers, disbelievers, and those that have uh, fallen into the different shades of nifaq, of hypocrisy. And then Surah Al-Baqarah moves on to speak about uh, the different types of human beings, the story of Adam alayhi uh, salam, the story of uh, Banu Israel, and the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The story of Banu Israel begins here at the ayat we're going to discuss today. And all that I just mentioned is just the first juz, the first 20 pages of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then the second juz of Surah Al-Baqarah is all with regards to uh, the rulings that Surah Al-Baqarah discusses, the major rulings of Islam in terms of prayer, the Qibla, uh, charity, uh, Hajj, fasting, uh, marriage, divorce, all, all of these types of rulings. Uh, and perhaps the connection between all of this so that you have a theme before we zoom in on these ayat is that Allah Azza wa speaks about the different types of people uh, with regards to how they responded to the question of their existence or their covenant with Allah, which is why they were brought into existence. So uphold their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lengthy discussion obviously is uh, given with regards to Banu Israel, because they are the nearest nation to us and the most resembling nation of us in terms of size, in terms of their tests, and in terms of the trip-ups that both of us will fall into. As the Prophet ﷺ said, that you will certainly fall in the footsteps of those before you, uh, footstep by footstep, hand span by hand span, even if they were going to a lizard's hole, you'd go in after them. Uh, and so the Sahaba would be very keen to make sure that when people were speaking about Banu Israel, they would not fall into the trap of thinking that 
we are reading about a people that are doomed uh, or a people that just messed up so bad and that every bad quality belongs to them as Abu Darda radiallahu anhu would say and every good quality belongs to you meaning you're delusional if you think that uh, in any case uh, we'll just jump into the beginning of the discussion of Banu Israel and these seven ayat and what we can take from them inshallah ta'ala so in the 40th ayah which is the first ayah we're discussing tonight Allah azza wa jal says Ya Bani Israel, adhkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum wa awfu bi'ahdi, awfi bi'ahdikum wa iyaya farhabun And so Ya Bani Israel, Allah Azza wa Jal calls out O Banu Israel Banu Israel means the sons of Israel or the children of Israel uh, Israel is the name of, another name for Ya'qub alayhi salam So O children of Jacob which uh, became the many tribes and clans of uh, known as the Israelites, the children of Israel. So, O children of Israel, meaning those of them in Medina currently, and, and whoever else this can apply to, um, because the Quran is always to be taken in terms of the generality of its uh, implications, not the specificity, how specific it is, the person or the group being addressed, uh, or else the Quran would just expire with the end of the very last person that existed in the context of its revelation right so o banu israel referring to the jews in uh that still remained in the time of medina or the jews beyond them or whomever else uh means this re reminder it applies to you as well o banu israel remember my favor which i have favored you with or bestowed upon you and fulfill my covenant I will fulfill your covenant, meaning fulfill your promise to me, and I will fulfill my promise to you. And only me should you have rahab of. Rahab is like khawf, but khawf in Arabic is pure fear. Rahab, it actually is the same letters as the word harab. Harab means to run away and flee. So rahab is like fear when it drives you to run in a certain direction. And of course, there's no running from Allah except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one that shares, that carries or possesses that quality. As the other ayat say in Surah the dhariyat فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ So run away, but where can you run? Run away to Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember the blessings of Banu Israel, meaning all of the blessings I've given you, the tiny and the, the titanic, the huge, all of them. And fulfill uh, my covenant. Uh, meaning your covenant to me, I will fulfill your covenant, meaning the, the promise that you have been given from me. And then what is the meaning of fulfilling this covenant? What's the only way to fulfill this covenant? The next ayat now, ayah 41. And believe in, meaning have full faith in and full commitment to. Um, what I have sent down, meaning the book upon Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Musaddiqan lima ma'akum, which confirms, meaning it's in agreement with that which, which, which is already with you. And this is profound. Allah is telling them, this book, which will be sent to Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, that was already foretold. It agrees with what you have in your book. Meaning if you disbelieve in this book, you're disbelieving in your book as well. So be careful. Because they were being selective. You know? And this is a reflection that we, inshallah we should come back to before the night is over. That they what happened was they forgot Allah's favor upon them. And so they started becoming selective in their religion. I will accept this book because it came to us. It's convenient. It's worth. It's worthy. Because it will give us bragging rights. But we won't believe the other book that we can't brag about because it wasn't sent to Banu Israel. And so we won't believe in the book that was sent to Muhammad well, And that's what people do. They become selective in their religion once they forget their uh, their duty to Allah and their debt to Allah, the favor he has bestowed upon them. This book confirms that which is with, already with you, meaning your book. And do not be the first to disbelieve in it. This is also very eloquent and very profound it's more than just saying don't disbelieve in it and don't be the first to disbelieve in it because that's the exact opposite of what you should be doing because you have 
the book with you, your book, the Torah. So you should be awaiting this book, meaning when it comes, you should be the first to believe in it. And so when you become the first to disbelieve in it, that's the very opposite. Also, some scholars mention, and do not be the very first generation, meaning to disbelieve in Muhammad because you will then be liable for every single person that follows in your footsteps. As the Prophet ﷺ said, whomever commits a good deed or directs to a good deed, whomever follows in suit, you get that reward. Likewise, whoever commits an evil. There's even a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, Abdullah al Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he says that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said once that no person is killed, for example, wrongfully, except that the first son of Adam, meaning the one who killed his brother, Will, will continue receiving a share of that sin because he's the very first person to introduce the hadith says he's the very first person to introduce the practice of murder he was the first person to murder on earth and so don't be the first to disbelieve in it and do not purchase with my verses a cheap price uh, meaning bragging rights, reputation, status, don't sell out uh, my signs for the, for this cheap price. And only me, fear only me. So the ayah before his farhabun, rush to me out of fear. Fattaqun means obey me out of fear. Because it's put in contrast to purchasing, meaning selling, uh, or exchanging my signs for a small price. And so fearing me here is, is not a feeling, it's a practice. It's refusing to sell, to exchange Allah's ayat for a small price. Taqwa equals action. This is ayah 42. And do not mix the truth with falsehood. That's what some people do. They try to give like a an Islamic justification. Ben Israel did this. To what is actually uh, to what is actually wrong, you give it like a a right veneer, but at its core, it's wrong. Uh, you may fool yourself, possibly. You may fool others, quite possible. But you're not going to fool Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't do this. And don't nor conceal the truth while you know. That's something else they used to do. They used to just be silent about the truth, and neither of those was permitted of them. Anyone who receives the book has to say it and say it purely say it straightforward this is the religion of allah i do not possess keeping this to myself i cannot nor do i possess mixing it in a way that would align with the popular culture at the expense of allah's pleasure and of course there's a difference between presenting islam in a way that resonates with the culture meaning giving them what they need, the pure religion of Allah al-Islam, sharing it with them in a way that's appealing to them, in a way they want, as opposed to giving them what they want, which is uh, our short-sighted, limited, clouded, biased desires with a with a godly tint, right? To justify, okay, God will accept of you whatever you're already upon. And then the ayat go on to tell Banu Israel, how can you get back with the program? Return to the basics, right? Uh, back to basics, the timeless fundamentals. Establish the prayer and give the zakah. And bow along with those who bow. Keep good company. Make salah in jama'ah. And so interestingly, the Prophet ﷺ, even for us, told us these are the pillars of Islam. Salah, zakah, these are the pillars of Islam. And so when your Islam becomes like empty and becomes tasteless and becomes shaky, then what you need to do is go back to the basics. Check the pillars of your house, right? Check the super foundation, which is your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then check the, 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 the founding pillars of the house, your salah, your zakah, your hajj, your fasting. How, how much quality uh, has been drained from them that will explain your Islam. And so Allah Azza wa tells Banu Israel, establish the prayer, pay the zakah, and bow with those who bow. Humble yourself along with those who are humbling themselves before Allah. Then Allah Azza wa speaks about, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ This is Ayah 44. Do you command people, instruct people with righteousness? وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ You forget yourselves. وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ While you are currently reciting the scripture, 
you're currently proficient, actively telling people what God is saying. <laughs> Will you not reason? You know, interestingly, the word يعقلون, it means to reason, yes. But the aql, the mind, was called the aql. You know, the iqal. Iqal is the rope you tie an animal with, the reins uh, that you tie an animal with or tie them to a stable with. Even, you know, if you ever, people like in the Gulf countries, when they wear like their their uh, their headgear, there's a rope they put on top of their head. That's called their iqal because their iqal is a rope. And so the do you have no mind meaning to restrain you? That's what a mind is supposed to do. It's supposed to tell you this is good, go after it. This is not good and it'll keep you, it'll pull you back from it. And so how can you get yourself to do this? How can you get yourself to command people with good and forget about yourselves? Uh, of course, these are two separate obligations. People should know that always. We always have to make that disclaimer. You doing the right thing, uh, that's bare minimum. You instructing and promoting others to do the right thing, that could also be your obligation to the degree of your ability and your knowledge. And so you slacking in either of those is not a, a, does not excuse you for, for being negligent in the other. In other words, if you're not practicing the right thing, you still have to command people to do the right thing. Those are two separate obligations. If you were to slack in doing the right thing, and I add on top of that that you're not promoting people to, towards the right thing. Those are two separate uh, sins, two separate mistakes. That's double problematic. Obviously, if you're telling people the right thing and you're not doing it yourself, that's not going to be very effective at all, right? Um, but neither doing nor telling is is actually the worst form, is actually the worst form, to the point that our scholars used to say that if a person is sitting there smoking, and he's sitting with someone else smoking, he's obligated to stop smoking. And whether or not he stops smoking, he still has to tell the person in front of him, you shouldn't be smoking. Your body is an amana. I trust that Allah will ask you about to the end of it. Right? Those are two separate things. Even if you continue smoking, you still have to tell him to stop. Surely it's not going to be very effective because actions speak louder than words. But it, nonetheless, this is still your duty. Um, and perhaps that is why the likes of these ayat come in and say, how could you do this? How could you say something? How could you reduce religion to table talk, wherein it's not moving you even? So how can you be satisfied just with telling others? Just with telling others. Because that's the worst form, right? Doing the right thing and telling others to do the right thing, that's the best form. Beneath it is you doing the right thing and being negligent and telling people to do the right thing. Beneath it, the worst form is for you to tell people to do the right thing and you're not even doing it. That's why there's a hadith in, uh, in uh, of course, there's a, there's a degree below that, which we already talked about, which is do, neither doing nor telling. But the point of it being the, the worst of the three forms, the weakest of the three forms, the most, there's a hadith of, uh, of Usama, Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Bukhari and Muslim. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man will be brought forth on the day of judgment. Yajurru khusubahu finnar fayulqa finnar hatta indalikha aqtabuhu. He says he will be uh, thrown in the hellfire and his intestines, his insides will, will, will come out, will, will spill out. And then he will continue to circle around them, circle around them, around this, and فَيَجْتَمُوا عَلَيْهِ أَهِ النَّارِ And so the people of the fire will all gather around this person and say to him, oh, so and so, didn't you used to command us with good? And didn't you used to forbid us from evil? And he would say, yes, I used to command you with good and not do it. And I used to forbid you from evil and I used to do it. And so his true colors came out. And perhaps that's the symbolism in his intestines being ripped out. وَالْعَيَاتُ بِاللَّهِ May Allah protect us and you from such a faith. But what his insight, his his reality came out. Then the last two ayat uh, say that Allah Azza says, "Wasta'inu bi-sabri wa-sala," and seek help in all of this in, in working back up the mountain, basically, bi-sabri wa-sala, in patience and in prayer. Wa innaha la kabiratun, and it is something very big, meaning it's a burden. Illa al-khashi'in, except those that are in awe of Allah, humbled. By their awe, their recognition of Allah. Who are the khashi'in? الَّذِينَ يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُ رَبِّهِمْ وَأَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Those who are certain that they will meet their Lord 
and that they will be returning to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and so what is it that makes your islam easy once again what is it it's the fact that you're in awe of allah what causes you to be in awe of allah your yaqeen your certainty your conviction in allah and in meeting him and in his reward and in his punishment that is what makes it not difficult to submit wholeheartedly right when naha la kabiratun ayah 45 it is difficult illa al khashi'in except for those who have khushu' are in awe of humbled awe of allah who are those that have khushu' alladhina yadhunnuna those who are certain that they will meet their lord subhanahu wa ta'ala wa annahum ilayhi raji'un you know there's a hadith also in sahih al bukhari very quickly just to, to match up the ayat the hadith where the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says that allah will bring forth a person on the day of judgment and he will say to him oh so and so didn't i marry you off didn't i uh, honor you didn't i subdue for you uh, horses and camels meaning transportation uh, and i allowed you to to attain positions of leadership and i allowed for you uh, to collect spoils of war meaning lots of money he said, you did, my Lord. He says, Did you think that you were going to meet me? And he will say, no, I did not think I was going to meet you. So he will be told, So today I will forget you the way you forgot me. Of course, Allah doesn't forget. This person didn't forget either. He acted like, he dealt with Allah as if he forgot about him. He ignored Allah, so Allah will ignore him on that last day. And so the solution to remembering Allah Azza wa Jal is to build our certainty in Him so that we don't ignore our relationship with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's heavy, kabira illa al khashi'een alladhina dhunnuna annahum mulaqu rabbihim. Those certainly meet their Lord. And then the last ayah here once again says, Ya Bani Israel, adhkuru al-amati allati an'amtu alaykum wa anni fadaltukum ala al-alameen. O Banu Israel, remember my favor over you and that I've preferred you over uh, all of the worlds. I made you the chosen people. Of course, they were the chosen people, not unconditionally, but for certain reasons. Allah doesn't play favoritism with anybody. They were the chosen people for a certain reason. Uh, and so, if you notice here, just to close out, because I'm, I'm short on time now, if we realize the ayat begin with Obanu Israel, remember my favor. And then they end here, this section of ayat, O oh, Banu Israel, remember my favor. So it's as if this whole discussion addressing Banu Israel is captured almost like parentheses or like brackets, is, is fenced off by Allah reminding them of his favor, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is the secret. If you feel like life has become tasteless, you need to go back to gratitude. Doesn't Allah, جل, for example, say, uh, we have given you the abundance, so pray to your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so worshipping Allah is an expression of our love and gratitude to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you need to go back and give yourself time. And I wish to just say two things about gratitude. Number one, gratitude is a mentality. Gratitude is a mentality. And that's why throughout the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal essentially refuses to mention the big favors whenever he's calling us he talks about the trees and the you know the mount the, the things we consider mundane because whoever is not grateful for the little things will not be grateful for the big things that's the whole trick it's a mentality and allah azza wa jal has made that mentality very easy for someone that puts in the work and tries to become mindful because allah obligated you to begin all the prayers with alhamdulillah rabbil alamin and so when you say alhamdulillah rabbil alamin don't let it, you know, be empty. Think of a, of a ni'mah, of a favor, and make it small because it's about mentality, catching the small things. Because if you don't catch the small things, you're not going to catch the big things. So, you know, like one of our mashayikh used to say, just think about the smallest thing. Like if you're praying asr after work and you, uh, you smell dinner in the kitchen, just, okay, intend with your alhamdulillah rabbil alameen that I'm so lucky to have a warm dinner waiting for me. You know, when, when you were driving to work, that morning a few hours before your lunch break where you prayed dhuhr when you say alhamdulillah just keep to bring to mind that swerve someone swerved into your lane or you swerved into their lane because everyone's on their phones while driving nowadays these little things you know that's the first thing being grateful is a mentality second thing you need to know about gratefulness 
at the core of gratefulness is feeling broken feeling how can i where do i begin repaying you oh allah that's that feeling that will make worship dear to you and bring the meaningfulness back to your ibadah with allah azza wa jal you know one one man this is the story i'll mention to you as i close here now uh one uh, elderly man was rushed into a hospital uh he had to be rushed into an emergency surgery one of his organs failed and it was a risky surgery at that age and they weren't sure he was going to get out uh, alive and so when the doctors came out to his family in the waiting room they said to him to them you know like basically alhamdulillah they said to him like you know thank god he he's gonna make it and so the kids didn't know what to expect i mean it was a shocker like it just happened sort of like instantaneously call the ambulance get him to the hospitals they were just all on edge so when the doctor reassured them they all just broke down you know the anxiety you know was at the brim and they all broke down crying and basically hugging and kissing the doctor like doc we don't even know what to say like what do we begin like how can we ever repay you like you saved our and so they they went into the room and they saw their their father and they found him crying as well uh i'm not sure if he saw them crying through the glass or something and so so uh they wanted to make sure he didn't misread their their tears that like the doctor gave them bad news or something they said dad don't, don't cry it's gonna be okay to the end of it uh they said the surgery was a success and he said to them wallahi this is not why i'm crying you know he said i'm crying because i've had this organ for 70 years and i've never felt this way about allah the way we feel about the doctor right now like doc i love you so much like i don't know what to tell you i can't even find the words to express it that feeling of gratitude where it's beyond words is more deserved by allah Azza wa Jal than by anybody else and that's why it's mentioned that among banu israel actually we could connect it with banu israel as we close it was said that Dawood alayhi salam, the great king of Banu Israel and uh, prophet among Banu Israel, said, Oh Allah, how can I ever thank you? When me thanking you is yet another blessing from you that deserves thanks. Even if I say Alhamdulillah, you're the one who reminded me to say Alhamdulillah, so I need to say Alhamdulillah for Alhamdulillah. But then again, I have the fact that I remembered that is another, so it's like an endless chain. So how do I ever repay you? And so, and this is the point, Allah Azza wa revealed to Dawood alayhi salam, O oh Dawood, you realizing that, you realizing that, that you cannot repay me, this is, this is the gratitude that I expect of you. That's it. You have repaid me. The thanks I obligate you with at the core of it is realizing that we are unequipped to give due thanks. When you have that feeling, you will be like the Prophet Sallallahu who praised the night, his feet swell, he enjoys it. Why? He says, shouldn't I be a grateful slave? It's not about I must, is it obligation, is it haram? It's way beyond that. It's a much more sweet, much more pleasant relationship. May Allah grant us and you that relationship in our deen with him. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallahu khairan. I will stop here and open the floor for questions. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shadu la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka natu ulayk. Jazakallahu khairan. Jazakallahu khairan, Sheikh. Um, that's very beneficial, mashallah. So in terms of questions from the participants, um, the procedure is that the questions will come in writing. Um, there is a tab on the webinar, um, so participants can feel free to, to ask questions there, and I, I will moderate those questions and present some of them over to you. Um, so inshallah, I'll, I'll start with a, with a question, inshallah. So, you know, mashallah, we have, you know, over... Uh, 100 participants, mashallah, on this uh, webinar, and many of the people on the call are workers of the Dean. Many of them are working for Ikna. And reflecting a little bit on the verses that you've just recited, you know, they start off by addressing the Bani Israel, but obviously they're relevant for, for all of us. And as workers of the Dean, we sometimes can feel into this trap of feeling that we're immune from everything because we were working for the dean and the verses that you recited talked about reminding us not to forget about ourselves you know that you remind others but we also must not forget about ourselves so for the work of the dean what would be your top two or three pieces of advice that we should try to do let's say every day or, or very regularly at least uh, to prevent us 
getting into this trap of forgetting about ourselves. Especially for the worker of the deen. Yeah, Um and so all of the acts of worship, the grace of the acts of worship in Islam, uh the objective behind them is the purity of your heart, right? Establish the prayer to become mindful of me. Uh, fast, you know, become conscious of Allah. Zakah, um, you know, uh, take from their wealth, you know, a charity to purify them with it. And so a person needs to make time. They must make time. Uh, to find out what is the effect of my acts of worship. What's the fruit? Do I feel closer to Allah Azza wa or not? Because if I don't, we're not going to stop doing Islamic work. No, because that would be part of the uh, of the due diligence that we're, that we're skipping out on or that we're falling short in. But we're going to start becoming more conscientious, start becoming more serious about finding that intention of ours finding the the fruit of our work and the fruit of our labor in this dunya in this dunya there is a first installment of the reward to kind of reassure the believer a little bit that he's on the right track uh the state of your heart is that is is just that and so check on the tenderness of your heart because if the tenderness of your heart is not there uh then number one you're not going to be able to continue in the islamic work or number two, you will continue for the wrong reasons. So either way, it's a problem. Either way, it's a big problem. And so, uh, you know, for example, sincerity. Sincerity, one of, as one of the scholars, you know, uh, gives a beautiful litmus test for, he says, there's a greatness to Allah. If you don't find it in your heart, then it's likely not what drives your actions. Then it's likely not what drives your actions. And so when you find yourself in prayer, just going through the motions or not praying on time or not getting up for Fajr, uh, when you find yourself in times of nasiha, when Allah and his messenger are being mentioned, you're not very interested or you just, you're just you there for the entertainment, just wondering, am I going to hear a story I never heard before? Uh, as opposed to, oh man, I heard this, this I, I've heard this so many times and I still haven't lived up to it, or it's been so long since I thought about it. It's a completely different mentality that reflects a regard of for Allah in your heart and so that that would be the first thing um, to look for the fruits of your good deeds the fruits of your Islamic work at heart at heart because look at the end of the day none of this really none of this will really matter if, if the heart is not in the right place right like I as one good brother said if you make the whole world Muslim <laughs> And you attain world peace and you solve world hunger and you just do everything uh but it's not for allah then that's not why you're here correct i mean allah Azza wa could have done this without you but he put you here to test you who will do the best deeds for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala this whole world is an exam paper the whole world is going to crumble and get shredded the exam paper is going to get shredded in the end anyway and so it's about the quality of your service while you're here uh before the exam is over um and so allah is testing your heart in the direction of your heart and the interest the pursuit your your primary pursuit at heart before anything else uh that's number one number two you're gonna have to find a find a mentor or people that can be substitute mentors until you find a mentor people to be friend, people you're not a superstar in front of as, as one good brother says as well you know like you're in spheres where you could be the leader you could be the energy man you could be that the engine of the da'wah you could be like a rock star i don't want to use the term rock star but yeah, a superstar in your respective field. Go find a field where you're not a rock star. Go find a field where you're not uh, a superstar, where you're just an average person who can be forgotten about in the crowd, can have their, their mistakes pointed out for them, can be reminded about their flaws and their humanness. Uh, ask Allah to help you find that sphere. That uh, cannot be uh, overstated, the importance of something like that. And number three is dua. You, you you want to know your station with Allah, uh, then you're going to have to determine what's Allah's station with you 
in private. In private doesn't mean you have to be in a room by yourself. In private could be in your sujood when no one can hear you, uh, in your downtime, in your whispers, uh, your dua. You have to develop an intimate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get you through the turbulence of da'wah, turbulence of serving the deen. Because shaitan wants you to fall more than anybody else because a, a, a devout worshiper is only benefiting themselves. So if they fall off, only one person is falling off. But a servant of the masses, if they fall off, uh, everyone they carry on their shoulders falls with them. And so, number one, look for the fruit, the tenderness of the heart. If not, go fix it. Make time to fix it. Balance between the individual obligation and the collective obligation. Visit the graveyards and visit the sick and reflect on the Quran and increase in your ibadah and focus in your ibadah and turn off your phone and disconnect. That's number one. Go find your heart. Um, Number two, try to find a mentor, a place to, to to find some brokenness, to find some humility, to find find your flawed self, to keep it humble. And number three is build an intimate relationship with Allah, learn to speak to Him, and have lengthy dialogues with Him, Subhanahu wa Taala, asking Him for help to continue and continue for the right reasons and not be derailed by Shaitan. Those are my advices. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah, Khalid. Um, mashallah, very very good advice. So the next question I have is, how do you teach? Teenagers, gratitude. I mean, the beauty of gratitude is ingrained. The beauty of gratitude is fitra. Uh, it is fitra. Um, but sometimes that fitra can be buried, uh, buried by, by entitlement, buried by, you know, the, the distractions. If you, you know the ayah in Surah uh, uh, An-Nisa? Or the Araf, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that shaitan, he tells us what shaitan says to warn us of it. That shaitan says when he vowed to destroy us all, he said, I'm going to come to them from their right and their left and front them and behind them, and you will not find most of them to be grateful. And so he comes at you from every angle, right? And so gratitude requires patience. Gratitude is not the opposite of patience or separate of patience. You know, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he says something that's just uh, so wise, reflective of the wisdom of, of a sahabi, you know, a student of the Prophet sallallahu He said that we were tested with hardships and we were patient, and then we were tested with comforts, luxuries, ease, and we were not able to be patient. Because being, uh, I guess, being enduring persevering in hardship requires patience patience to persevere right and showing gratitude in luxury or in comfort requires patience and that one is harder it's harder to show gratitude it requires more patience more of like a struggle a fight to lock yourself that's what patience is to lock yourself where you don't want to be to lock yourself upon gratitude is harder than to lock yourself upon not objecting to Allah, not disbelieving in Allah during hardships. And that's why our teenagers, they're in that sense of entitlement. They're discovering their self, they're discovering their independence, they're discovering their autonomy. And then in this part of the world, you add the, the, the wrench of, uh, of materialism. And so we're not, what you, you need to do is help them hold on to gratitude by, if they're young enough, by showing them that they're not entitled to everything they have. Right, you're not entitled to to every last thing you have. You have to earn things. Also, by just taking them to visit, visit. It's just a treasure chest. The hospital is a treasure chest. The feeding the the homeless is a treasure chest. Um, visiting the graveyards is a treasure chest. You're not entitled to life or to health or to a meal or to any of these things. It didn't have to be this way, you know. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to us, this is the advice that I'm relaying to you regarding your teenagers, just find a crafty, I trust your judgment, you'll find a crafty way to, to, to present this or package this for your teens. But he said, if you find yourself looking at those that have been preferred above you in dunya, uh, then, let, then go look at those beneath you because that will help you not belittle Allah's favors over you. Right. And so in our time, in our culture, especially with the accessibility that social media gives us, we're comparing ourselves not with other people's lives. We're comparing ourselves with other people's selective snapshots of their lives, like their highlight reel. It's not even their real life. 
And so we're always looking at those above us or those we assume are above us. And so what we need to do is counteract that. The antidote to that is to continue to flood ourselves with those that are less fortunate in the worldly sense. Uh, that's very important. That's a win-win if you can involve your children in uh, service of this nature and vis virtuous vis visitations of this nature. Uh, that would help, among other things, but I think that's the most practical action item that comes to mind right now. Zakulah Karen, I have a question. Um, it's a clarification that's requested. Um, could you clarify about asking to do good while you may not be doing good yourself um, versus the hadith about the man in the hellfire? Yes. yes. So just keep in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is criticizing, not that they're saying, not that they're saying, to people do the right thing because you're supposed to do that. He's criticizing the fact that they themselves know it well enough to say it and they're not doing it. And so there's two ways you can react to this, to this reprimand from Allah Azza wa Jal. You can stop saying the right thing, stop promoting good, that would make you worse. Or you can add to your promotion of good, the embodiment, you acting upon good, and that would make you better. Okay, and so there's the solution to you uh, preaching what you don't practice is not that you stop preaching, it's that you start practicing what you preach. That th There's no other legitimate <laughs> solution except that. That's what we're trying to say. Because many people misunderstand that. They think, okay, let me just stop talking so I don't be a hypocrite. No, no, no. That's a double wrong, that you stop talking and stop acting. No, you can't do that. And there's a great wisdom to this, by the way, just time may not permit to explain it because it, it, nobody's sinless. And so if we say, how can I, you know, tell people not to sin when I still sin? Well, in that case, then no one would ever promote good, right? I hope that answers the question. Yeah, does that work out? So um, with that, that will make that the last question. Um, so it remains only to thank you, Sheikh Mohammed al Shanawi, uh, for um, taking time out of your schedule to um, uh, to help us learn from you. Um, next week's session, inshallah, will be the third in our series. The title of it is How Do You Prepare for Your Biggest Challenge? Uh, this will be delivered by Dr. Kia Jahid. Uh, and it will be focusing on uh, the verses 73, uh, sorry, verses 1 to 10 and 20 from Surah al -Muzamil. So that will be again, same time, 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, next Wednesday. Uh, and with that, we'll close. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdi. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiraka wa atubu alayk. Audu billahi minash shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr. In the Linsana Lefikos, in the Ladina Amanu, Aminu Saniha, what to us all Bill Hack, what to us all Bissar, Salakalan. Salam.